And uh, Pastor Byron and the Richardson pastoral team is just such a blessing uh, to my life, to our school. Uh, they teach classes, they speak for chapels, they show up at lunch. Um, and man, you, get, you guys have a good team here of pastors. And it's a blessing to be able to speak here today. I'd like to think um, that I'm kind of like an eclipse, okay? Uh, maybe rarely seen, but it's always special when I am. <laughs> amen. I got one amen. We're going to spend the rest of the service praying for the rest of you. Um, it is Education Sabbath, and so before we get into the message, although I, I don't believe that the pulpit should be used for promo unless you're promoting Jesus, amen, um, I do want to share with you a little bit about NDA because uh, I'm passionate about it, and uh, it's Education Sabbath. So just a few details, and then we'll separate it with prayer and move right into the Word of God, amen. Um, North Dallas Adventist Academy is located just right up uh, this road, up, well, a few other roads up here, off of 2800 Custer Parkway. We're a K-12 Adventist school. Um, Richardson is one of our awesome constituent churches, and um, we want to provide Adventist education for everyone. Amen? Uh, everyone. And we, we would love to have every single young person at this church in, that, in our school there. Um, a few ways. For most of you, when I say Adventist education, uh, most of the parents or grandparents who are trying to slide their kids into Adventist education think dollar signs, right? Because you're thinking about the bills and the budget and the rent, and you're like, I don't know about that whole extra payment for school. Um, what I would encourage you to do is to just check out the school, talk to someone, ask questions. Um, I think far too often we, uh, we might possibly limit God and what he's able to do because we don't, we don't ask the next question, you know? to see what further possibilities he has to offer, to see what other doors might be open, right? Um, with NDAA, if you, or if you were to enroll this fall, you would be in tuition lock for the next three years, okay? Tuition lock, I'm pretty sure, if my financial ideas serve me correct, means that it doesn't change in coming years, meaning it doesn't go up, amen? My rent is not in lock, uh-huh. <laughs> Right? Are you okay? Are we picking up the same thing? Okay. My rent, amazingly, over the last four years has gone up every year. My apartment hasn't gotten any nicer. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Okay. Um, but they did fix my AC last week, so that was a blessing, I guess. Okay. So you would be in tuition lock for the next three years, meaning that it's not a surprise. Here's more money that you need to pay us next year or the year after that. In addition, NDA has something that few other schools have, which is what's called the Sentinel Scholarship. Okay. The Sentinel is our like mascot uh, and. Uh, Symbol? Okay. Anyway, Sentinel is our scholarship um, fund, and that's real money that is donated on a regular basis to that fund that gets um, given out to families um, that apply and that are approved and uh, that are in need. And it's like a simple three-step process to get approved. Lots of families get approved, and money is then taken off of their bill for the Sentinel scholarship. Okay, so it's less money. It's a way to actually lower your bill for North Dallas Adventist Academy. And that's why I would encourage you. It's really super easy to say, oh, that's probably not in the wheelhouse. Let me not even look that direction. I would encourage you to look that direction. If it's on your heart, if you want your kids or your grandkids or your nephew or your neighbor's kids, you might want to talk to your neighbor about that before you sign them up for a private school. Okay, but if you want them to experience Adventist education, please, 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 just ask questions, right? Uh, my friend Brad, I got in trouble a lot for thinking this thought process, but I think it's slightly good. Brad, would, my friend Brad growing up would always tell me, just ask your mom if we can do this. What's the worst thing that can happen? She could only say no, right? Now, that's not a great way to live your entire life, but I would encourage it with Adventist education. Ask questions, show up, take a tour, see what it's like, Ask these students, talk to any staff members that are here. I know we have a booth out there. Um, they're happy to talk with you. I'm happy to talk with you. I don't know a ton because I literally just teach Bible and I try to stay in my lane, okay? So don't get too confused, all right? Um, but I'm happy to talk with you and we want to we wanna see every kid at North Dallas Adventist Academy. Um, okay, uh, real quick, uh, if we can... Um, read this back here. I'm, I, I really like the Richardson SDA Church vision, and that's not just because like, uh, I'm a member here. Okay, um, can we read that together one more time? Is that okay? Okay, I, I didn't hear any no's. Amen. Okay, so we're just going to read that together, and then we'll get into the word. Um, we are a growing family risking everything in Christ to forge relationships, create disciples, and transform our communities before Christ's returns. I think that that vision ties in really well with what we're going to talk about today for the message. If you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we'll begin reading in verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4. Um, and actually, before I get into that, sorry, I, I forgot I had one more announcement. One more announcement. Um, we are looking for a house parent opportunity. So NDA has started a company to provide housing for non-resident students at our school. Um, North Dallas is uh, blessed to have a, a good amount of students internationally coming in, and international students are always looking for places to live. Um, and so a furnished residence has been obtained. It's a three-bedroom, three-and-a-half bath condo. It's within walking distance from NDAA. And um, uh, the leader of this is in search of a mature married couple or a single mature person, amen, okay, yeah. willing to occupy the condo and be host parents for no more than four students. Here's the part that you're going to love. The cost to host parents is only $450 a month, which includes rent and utilities. No amens for that. Okay. Yeah. Let's up that rent and we can put it towards my food fund if we're not feeling that. Okay, uh, $450 is less than the majority of the room is paying to live where you live. Uh, I'm not trying to dive into your finances, that's awkward. Okay, qualified candidates must be English speaking, non-smoking, be able to pass a background check, amen, and complete child safety training, amen. Okay, but um, for more information, you can talk to Cassandra Lake. She's right here. Um, there we go, everybody say, wave, wave, wave. Okay, all right. Um, so if you're interested in becoming a house parent, um, I, I, I'm passionate about our international students having a safe place to live, okay? Um, and sometimes they come here and they're not always connected with some of the greatest, um, the greatest connects. And so if we can connect them with a loving Adventist family or a mature Adventist single person that can uh, experience Christ with them and give them a safe place to be, we want to do that. Um, also, some of you might look at that $450 a month for rent and utilities and you're like, amen, the Lord has spoken to my heart. Okay. 1 Corinthians 13. Now I think we're ready. If I forgot anything else, I'm sorry. Um, verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, you are here. This is your house. Lord, we're here to worship you. We're here to meet with you, and we need to hear from you now today. Lord, thank you so much for the place we have here to worship, the songs that have been saying the truth about you, Lord. You are amazing, God. Now speak to us now, otherwise we won't get what we need, and we need it so desperately, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Um, so I want to start off the sermon before I get into a story that this sermon is for me. Sometimes I think um, maybe people who view people who preach think that the preacher has it together and the preacher is preaching because he has it together. So he somehow figured it all out by Friday night and now he is holified and holy. Holified is not a word, sorry. Hope it's not a bad word either because I just made it up. But he is now ready and prepped and he is better than everybody else he's preaching to because he has this knowledge. So as I share this sermon, this is for Rob Parrish first, just so you know. This is for me. As I preach it, I am trying to actually apply it to my life because I'm not so great at it, okay? So just know I don't come up from up here down to you, and I'm going to give my wisdom, okay? All right? That doesn't mean I don't have wisdom, amen? Okay, all right. So how many of you in your lifetime have ever played hide-and-seek? This is the part where you raise your hands. We kind of worked on this earlier. It was a total warm-up activity earlier. Okay, how many of you have ever played, um, when you, how many of your kids, anybody have kids, how many of your kids like to play hide-and-seek? Nope, no kids in here like to play hide-and-seek. That is a whole lie. Okay, <laughs> what in the world? Okay, how many of you have ever thought, hey, you should play hide-and-go-seek, and then you're like, wait, I might lose my kid. Maybe this is not a good activity. Okay, <laughs> anyway, sorry, side note. All right, so how many of you ever played tag? Anybody ever played tag? Okay, good. You're getting, I'm going to make you raise your hand, so you might as well just, like, do it, okay? So, some of you are, like, resisting. I, I know nothing about tag. Okay, that's also a whole lie. It's like you play it since you're, like, old enough, right? How many of you have ever played, wait for it, hide-and-seek tag? Oh. I saw some hands raised, and I also saw some, there's an exciting, mm, okay? I don't know if that's because some of you know what it is or some of you don't know what it is. I guess it's kind of cool. I didn't think it was that cool. It was, like, audible. Oh, what is hide-and-seek tag? Okay, we're not playing it during church. Okay, so I was 10 or 11 years old. My dad is a pastor in Withville, Virginia, and so I'm at church a lot, and I'm at church at, uh, during prayer meeting all the time, 
right? And I probably should have been in church, but I wasn't. I was outside the church, and my friends and I were playing hide-and-go-seek tag. Now, I like hide-and-go-seek tag better because hide-and-go-seek can be a very quick game if you get found very quickly, amen? And I've never been super great at hiding, all right? You gotta get found super fast, but with the whole tag element, the person can find you, and then if you can evade them and run away from them and make it to the safe base or area or whatever, you're good to go, all right? And I was like, this is my type of game, because I get two chances, all right? If you fail at first, try, try again, right? And so we're all playing outside. It's dark outside, and um, I'm hiding. So someone is looking for me, and, and, and I get found immediately, it feels like. This is the story of my life, right? I'm going to hide. Ha <laughs> ha, found you immediately that fast, really? Okay, and it hasn't gotten any easier, okay? Just <laughs> as, you, as, you get, as you grow and become buff, such as myself, Hiding spots get harder and harder, right? I was going to hide under that bed, but I can't because <laughs> I can't fit there, okay? And when I try to hide behind the curtain, I can't, right? It's like, why does the curtain go out, <laughs> all right? And then, okay, wow, you guys are laughing at that. That's cool. Okay, so anyways, I'm hiding, and the person who's it finds me. Now, I evade them because I'm amazing, okay? I don't know what type of moves I put on. I don't know if it was like a you know, or like a sidestep, and I'm on the run, and they are in hot pursuit, and I run across the front of, like, the church parking lot, and I'm running, and I feel like I'm doing pretty good. I'm like, man, I don't know if I've ever been this fast, okay, right, and I, I, I go down the front of the church, like, the front yard of the church, and there's, like, a slight downhill, and so you can kind of catch up, catch up a lot of speed going on a downhill. Have you ever been running so fast that you're not really running anymore? Your body's just moving forward, and your legs, you feel like your legs are, like, just flying back, I don't really want to show you because it could cause injury, okay? But like, you know, you're just flying down there, and I'm running so fast, and I'm like, I have never been this fast in my life, okay? And I'm super excited. I'm like, I'm going to make it to base. This person has nothing on me. They were probably right behind me. I mean, let's be honest, okay? But I felt like I was the fastest kid at church that day, okay? Should have been in church. I make, the, I make the right turn around. I'm able to make that turn safely without falling, and I'm running straight across the backyard of the church, and I'm just flying, and I don't even remember where the safe area was. I don't even know if I was close, but I was beating this person. I was ahead of the game. I'm ready to go. I am fast. I am Usain Bolt, okay? <laughs> All right? Yeah. He ain't got nothing on me at 10 years old. That's probably not true, okay? Just want to be honest in the church. Okay, probably not true, but I felt like it, okay? I felt super fast. All right? And I'm running and running and running, and all of a sudden, I am airborne. And I'm not running anymore. I'm flying. Okay? But I'm flying feet first. That's, is that good? And there's a sound that's like, boom, and I'm like, I don't know if that's good. And then there's some pain on my face. Okay? And I'm like, what's happening? Okay, but I still haven't been tagged yet. My back hits the ground, and all of a sudden, I'm not moving anymore, and I try to take that first breath, and I can't get any air and any oxygen into my lungs. You, you ever remember the first time you got the wind knocked out of you like as a kid? Okay, when you're an adult, it's scary enough. When you're a kid, you think the end is here, okay? I never had the wind knocked out of me in my life, and so I thought, it's over. Jesus, take me now, okay? I think I'm ready. I don't know if I was baptized yet, but hopefully it's all good, right? Okay? These, I had weird thoughts as a 10-year-old, all right? I'm like, here it is. It's over. The end is here, okay? And then my friend comes up and says, tag, you're it. And I'm like, sir, we are having an emergency situation. It doesn't matter who's it right now. I cannot breathe, Okay? And so finally, they're realizing I can't breathe because I'm like, <laughs> okay? And I'm, I might have gotten a little watery-eyed, okay? I don't know if someone was, like, cutting onions nearby, but it was stressful, okay? And so then they're like, dude, you, you, look at your face. And I'm like, I mean, <laughs> what's wrong with my face? My face is amazing, okay? And they're like, you might want to go look in the mirror at that, okay? And that's not something I normally get, like, go look at yourself in the mirror. I mean, you know? You don't want to be vain, okay? And so I go and look at my face in the mirror, and I am bleeding, okay? And I have been successfully cut at my throat, at my chin, right above my chin, and then right above my eye. And I'm like, what in the world? And so what ended up happening was I had a full-speed clothesline situation with a grounding wire to a telephone pole, okay? Okay? I don't know if some of you experienced that. Well, yes, it was painful, okay? It was also painful telling my mom when I probably should have been in church, okay? That's one of those where it follows up with immediate, like, well, where should you have been worshiping, okay? <laughs> right? <laughs> Easy tie-in, right? Instant children's story, okay? When you are 
pursuing something, when you're chasing after something, and you have a full-on collision, transformation happens, right? Ever been, anybody ever been in a car accident? This is fun to do at churches. Very few people raise their hands, which is, I believe is a whole lie, okay? It's okay. We, we support you. People might not want to ride with you to church after that. You, like, brought somebody to church today, and you're like, yep. <laughs> Can I find a new church member? Okay, so when you have a car accident, does your car get transformed? Yeah. Now, maybe not positively, but yeah, it gets transformed. And today we want to look at what it is we are pursuing as followers of God. And I want to look at two stories, three Bible characters, two stories, and maybe that will help us kind of tie it all together. If you would turn your Bibles to Numbers 21, Numbers 21, Old Testament, um, Numbers 21, and we will begin with uh, verse 21. But let me give you just a little bit of context for Numbers 22. Numbers chapter 22, verse 21. So Numbers chapter 22, verse 21. The Israelites are on the brink of entering in the promised land for round two. They tried 40 years before, and it didn't work out so well. They got scared, okay? They got scared, and bad things happened, and they wandered in the wilderness for another 40 years. And they're on the brink of trying to enter into the promised land, but they're not quite there yet. And this isn't the point of the sermon, but I do want you to be aware that as followers of God, when God is trying to do something in your life, and he's about to do something that might be game-changing, you should be aware that there is a person named Satan that is going to throw everything in the kitchen sink at you to try to make that not possible. If you follow the Israelites' existence, every time something great's about to happen for them, or they have an opportunity to take that next step with God, usually something bad always comes and trips them up. We should be aware. I think sometimes we kind of forget that Satan really doesn't like us, and that he wants to trip us up any way that he can right? And so the Israelites weren't really aware of these things, and they didn't pay a ton of attention, and so they got tripped up a lot, right? And this is the exact situation that's happening as we meet up with a guy named Balaam. There's a king named Balak, king of the Moabites, and Balak doesn't want to have anything to do with the Israelites. A heathen king, and he does not like the Israelites, and he definitely is not down with the Israelites' gods, right? And the heathen kings of that, of that time period did not like the Israelites, why? Because every time you battled the Israelites, weird things happened and you lost. Okay? See the Red Sea, right? It opened up for them and closed up on the Egyptians. That's kind of weird. Okay? And if you're a heathen king that doesn't believe in God and you know Moses is going to be raising his hands up over the battle, you, you ain't trying to fight anymore. Okay? Every time the Israelites battled somebody, since God was in control, the heathen team lost. Okay? And the Israelites won. And I imagine they were left wondering, we just don't want to fight those people anymore. Can they just go away? Can they just go away? And so Balak is trying to figure out a plan to do this, and he decides to get a guy named Balaam to try to come curse the Israelites. And that's where we pick up our story. Numbers 22, verse 21. Numbers chapter 22, verse 21. And so um, if we look at, Balaam gets asked um, a few times to go. He gets asked by Balak once and then says no. He prays about it. God says no, don't do this. And then he gets asked again. Um, verse 18, but Balaam responded to Balak's messengers, even if Balak were to give me his palace filled with silver and gold, I would be powerless to do anything against the will of the Lord my God. But stay here one more night, and I will see if the Lord has anything else for him to say to me. So Balaam has already asked God once, hey, can I go curse the Israelites? Are you okay with that? Okay, and God has said, no, don't do that. Okay, and so then Balak sends back more people, more money, more opportunities, and Balaam's like, I mean, he said no, but I guess I'll ask again. Okay, all right? And so that night, God came to Balaam, this is verse 20, and told him, since these men have come for you, get up and go with them, but only do what I tell you to do. Verse 21, the next morning, Balaam got up, saddled his donkey, and started off with the Moabite officials. But God was angry that Balaam was going, so he sent the angel of the Lord to stand on the road to block his way. Interestingly enough, God told him to go, but then gets angry when he goes, right? Is it possible that maybe God let Balaam go just because that's what Balaam wanted so badly? You know, sometimes that happens, right? In like relationships, it's like, can I do this? No. Can I? Fine. But I didn't really want you to do that, okay? And then all of a sudden you have a problem on your hands, right? I wonder sometimes if God was just the same way. Fine, Balaam, if you really want to go, go, but you can only do what I tell you. But understanding that maybe the whole time Balaam was missing the point. The story gets more interesting. This is a fantastic story. But God was angry with Balaam. As Balaam and his two servants were riding along, verse 23, Balaam's donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. The donkey bolted off the road into the field, but Balaam beat it and turned it back to the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood at a place where the road narrowed between two vineyard walls. 
When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it tried to squeeze by and crush Balaam's foot against the wall. So Balaam beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved further down the road and stood in a place too narrow for the donkey to get by at all. This time, when the donkey saw the angel, it lay down under Balaam. In a fit of rage, Balaam beat the animal with his staff. Verse 28. Then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. Why have I done, what have I done to you that deserves your beating me three times? It asked Balaam. This is where it gets real awesome. Verse 29. You have made me look like a fool, Balaam shouted. If I had a sword with me, I would kill you. But I am the same donkey you have ridden all your life, the donkey answered. Have I ever done anything like this before? No, Balaam admitted. What is happening? What is happening to Balaam? And you've probably, you heard this story growing up, especially if you grew up in church or whatever. You heard this story and it was, the classic example was, you know, you got to obey God and do what God says and all those different things. Otherwise, talking donkeys occur. And I don't know if it was, probably wasn't fleshed out very well, but this is weird. This is not okay. Balaam is literally having a full-on argument with his donkey. And I get he's mad. His foot got crushed. The donkey sat on him. I get that you are stressed out and frustrated. But the donkey says, hey, what are you doing? And Balaam's like, you know what? I actually should kill you. And then the donkey's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's talk about our experience here. I'm a great donkey. And Balaam's like, yeah, you're right. You're pretty good. Okay? Like, what? What's happening? Now, be careful. We laugh at Balaam, but we might be closer to Balaam than we think. But we laugh. If I, I tell you what, I had a golden retriever. His name was Cooper. Cooper was like, he's, I mean, he's the only favorite pet I've ever had. He's one, he was wonderful, okay? And he, would, he was very talkative, right? He would grab a sock and then follow me around the house when I get home from work, and I'm, I'm assuming he was telling me about his day or lecturing me for being late from work. I mean, he went through this phase where he would lock himself in the bathroom, Okay, so I would leave I would leave all the doors open and he had free range of the house He was super good dog And then I would like come home and try to figure out where he was because he would always come running to the door When I would open the door. He was always like right there and I was like, how'd you get there so fast? Okay, but he'd be right there and 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 for this little phase of his life He was like in the bathroom and I'd have to go open the door to let him out And he would look at me like dude, why'd you do that to me? And I'd be like, why did you do that to yourself? But like the look on his eyes and his little growling motions or sounds, not motions, his little growling sounds were very like judgmental. Like, why would you lock me in the bathroom all day? Look, dude, why would you lock yourself in the bathroom all day? You're not going to own your actions, right? He's just a dog, okay? Literally had that conversation with him though. Like, can we talk about why you're doing this to yourself, okay? But if Cooper would have ever opened up his mouth and actually said, dude, why did you put me in the bathroom? We would have had problems. I would have filmed it hoping to get rich at least, and I probably would have called all the local pastors and been like, we need to come heal and pray over this experience and this house because my dog is literally talking to me. I don't think I would have argued with him. I don't think I would have been like, Cooper, you sit down, okay? Balaam is having a full-on argument with his donkey. He has no clue what's going on. Is it possible that Balaam is in such pursuit of that which he is chasing after that he has lost the logical functions of his life? We're going to come back to that story, and I promise it ties in. We're going to, but we're going to leave Balaam arguing with his donkey for a moment, okay? He probably has a whole lot more to say. Anyways, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and if you want to look at it, um, I'm going to, going to breeze over the story. But Luke chapter 10 features Jesus at the house of Lazarus in the town of Bethany. And Jesus would go to Bethany often um, because it was his, basically his place to get away, his place to relax, his place to be safe. And this was one of the first times he was at Bethany and hanging out at the house of Lazarus. And we catch the dynamic of Jesus sitting maybe in the living room, and he's hanging out, and Mary is at his feet. And this is the same Mary that two chapters before has been freed from seven demons, is, is no longer a prostitute, and is literally all about some Jesus. Quite possibly Jesus, not only being the son of God, was the best son, the son of man, that she had ever met, that ever treated her right ever treated her with any type of respect, any type of genuine godly love. And so she's sitting at Jesus' feet, and I picture him sharing, and she's learning, and probably the disciples are around listening too. Martha, whose gift and her way of like spiritually loving on people is probably acts of service, is getting the house ready for everything. Now, also, if you know the dynamic, sometimes when you're with your family, we like to treat each other best, and so we're like, why aren't you helping me, okay? And so you can imagine two sisters... Martha might feel some type of way about Mary's past as well. It's possible. It's not too far-fetched. 
Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha is busy getting everything ready. She has no help. And I imagine that she got more and more frustrated. And in my creative mind thoughts, I think that she probably passed Mary multiple times dropping those little passive-aggressive hints. Uh Uh-huh. Right? She probably walked in the living room. Oh, wow. There's so much to get ready. (sighs) Okay? Right? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, you're laughing because you either know somebody like that or it's you, okay, right? Okay, oh, these plates are so heavy, okay, right? And Mary is just zoned in on what Jesus is talking about. She does not hear her sister, right? And even if she did, she was probably like, I don't know, Jesus is talking about something amazing. I don't want to move plates around, okay? Oh, I wish I could have some help with the mashed potatoes, Okay, and so finally she gets so frustrated that she's like, I'm going to talk to Jesus about this. So now she's like, Jesus, you got to get in on this problem and fix it for me. So she goes to Jesus and she says, don't you care? And I, I love that she starts there. How often do when we get to Jesus, are we looking at him like, don't you care? And I'm not sure, church, honestly, how we get there in our minds. How do we get to a place with Jesus where we're looking at him and we think he doesn't care? He cared before we were ever created. I'm pretty sure he cares now. And he looks at her and with the most loving responses, and Jesus has the best way of giving like, kind of like a rebuke, but it's super, super loving. Like I just picture him super calmly looking at her with all this love in his eyes saying, Martha, Martha, you're concerned about many things. And notice he doesn't say you're concerned about the wrong things or bad things or evil things. He just says you're concerned about many things. But there's one thing that's important. Mary has found that good part, and it will not be taken from her. And so he tells Martha, hey, there's one most important thing, and your sister found it. And I want you to find it too. Not because what you're doing is bad, but you're so focused on the things that you are missing the thing that is most important. And Mary found it, and it better not be taken away from her. And you can see him also protecting Mary in her new little faith and relationship with Jesus, right? Church, I, I want to ask you, what is it that you and I individually are pursuing every single day? Because I believe it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference what we are chasing after as to what we become as followers of God, as humans, as people with lives and, 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 and journeys. What you chase after every single day makes all the difference. Ask Balaam. He's chasing after this kind of pot of gold type experience and hoping that he can get the riches and maybe sideways curse Israel. Maybe God will just kind of be okay with it. He's so focused on what he's pursuing that he's become a person who is arguing with the donkey that's trying to save his life. And when the donkey gets the permission to finally speak, he's got big problems with what this donkey is saying to him. And thankfully, finally, his eyes are open and he sees what the donkey sees. But unfortunately, his pursuit was so far along, he was so dedicated to the pursuit that he manages to go and bless Israel, but later on we find chapters later that he is the same very person who trips Israel up later. And that's sad, right? What you're pursuing ultimately has has everything to do with what you become. How often do we follow the things of God, and this is for me, and we do the things of God, and we do not pursue the person of Jesus Christ? And is it possible that that makes all the difference? Paul, in 1 Corinthians, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 13, that is where we're headed. Paul in 1 Corinthians, as he's writing to them, he has a, he has a lot to say. He's got a lot to say to the Corinthian church. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about spiritual gifts. And he lists all the different spiritual gifts, preaching and teaching and healing and prophecy and speaking in tongues. And and he goes all out on the spiritual gifts. And you need to know what your spiritual gifts are. And you should have spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts are for the edification of the body. And then he starts talking about the body. And he's like, the body should work together. And we're one body, even though we're different parts. And the hand can't say to the arm, I don't need you. And the eye can't say to the rest of the face, I don't need you. And and we all got to work together, right? And so he goes on and on for the whole chapter about all this stuff. And then he ends chapter 12 super interestingly. If you, look at, if you look at 1 Corinthians, the end of chapter 12, verse 29. 1 Corinthians 12, cha- 1 Corinthians 12 verse 29. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 29. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. 
But now, let me show you a way of life that is best of all. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And then he goes into, if I could speak all the language of the earth and of the angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And then we have, of course, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, which has quickly and always been used in, in marriage ceremonies and all of those things, and as a way to, and it's truthfully this way, as a way to show how much God loves us, right? God is patient and kind, keeps no record of wrongs, all those things, right? But what's interesting is in chapter 14, the very first verse of chapter 14, after, after 13, where he finishes with three things last forever, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. The first verse of 14 says, let love be your highest goal. Some translations say pursue love. And then he dives right back into all the gifts and talking about the gifts and all the different things you're supposed to do. And, and I guess I wonder kind of in, in my mind, and, 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 and hopefully it's a sanctified thought process, I wonder if he was so focused on the gifts and wanted the church to just grow and grow and grow in gifts, and then he paused and said, wait, let me put at the center of this the most important thing, which is love. Because this church might chase after all the things that I've talked about, but if they don't have love, it's really not going to matter. And then before I get talking about the gifts again, let me just remind them that they should chase after love. They should pursue love. And we're not pursuing just the action of loving. We are pursuing love. And love is not just something you do. Love is a person, and his name is Jesus. 1 John 4 tells us that God is love. It's not just something he does. It's who he is. So the first simple, simple point and you might look at this talk today and you say, well, that was cool, it was simple, it was, it was simple, that's fine. It's simple, but it's deeply, deeply hard. But the first point, we must pursue love. You and I must pursue love every single day. We must be in reckless pursuit of love, I would say. In reckless pursuit of Jesus. Now the beauty of it is if I'm pursuing Jesus and I'm running this way, the beauty of the Bible and what history shows me is that Jesus has already been pursuing me. We can't get out of Genesis chapter 3 without Jesus showing up, pursuing his people. Adam and Eve sin, and he comes down later that evening and says, hey, what's going on? Thought I'd show up and hang out. What's up? Let me show up. I'm pursuing you. He shows up to Abraham. He shows up to all these different things. He shows up on Mount Sinai. He has the Israelites build him a temple so that he can move in. And when it's finished, he does move in. That pillar of cloud hangs out inside the tabernacle. That's one of my favorite parts of the Bible. I wish that I could open up my front door and knew that Jesus was living down the street. Amen. Might change some of my interactions, right? But, you know, like, what, what if Jesus was legit your neighbor? Like, he's hanging out there. He's in the cloud. He's hanging out there. I don't know everything that means, but he's still hanging out right there. Jesus is your neighbor. He's trying to move in. He's making a home with his people. God pursues humanity so much that it's not beyond him to send his son down to save us, to save humanity, to live the perfect life. He's, it's not beyond that. So if I'm pursuing God and God has already been pursuing me, don't you think a collision is going to happen? And if we go all the way back to the first part, the very little sermon, the very little story about getting tripped up by a, by a telephone wire, when you have a collision, does transformation happen? It does. It does. And it should, right? It should. So the, number, the, the first point for today, there's only two. The first point for today is we've got to pursue love. We've got to pursue Jesus Christ. And I'm, and I'm talking more than just in the little bit of time you might spend with him every day. That's a great place to start, but God is about your life. God is about your life. He wants every part of your life. He's not just trying to exist in the morning or with your Bible app or at church or at prayer meeting or whatever it is you do. He's about your entire life. Maybe it's time to include the God that cares about your life so much to redeem it into every part of it. But that's, that's easier said than done, but man, it's so worth it. Because God cares about your life, he intends to redeem it every single part. We must pursue Jesus every day. That's point number one. We must pursue Jesus. And then with that pursuit, we must then live that love. It's education Sabbath. And you might not remember a lot about what you learned in school, but you can remember a lot about the teachers that impacted you, both good and bad. And I'm willing to take a pretty decent-sized bet. Gambling's inappropriate. I'm willing to take a pretty decent-sized bet that the teacher that impacted you most was the teacher that lived it every single day. And they were that person, and they were so excited about science, and they eat, and eat, slept, and lived, and breathed science, and you were like, wow, I like science too, okay? And you don't know where it came from, but there it was, because they lived it every single day. Church, we've got to pursue Jesus every single day, and then we've got to live that love every single day. 
And if you think that that's like the fluffy, lovey-dovey, oh, man, this guy's up here talking about love. You know, we got to be doing stuff. We do got to be doing stuff. But guess what? Love is hard. If we're really going to love like 1 Corinthians 13, if we're really going to try to love like God loves us, if we're really going to take Jesus at his word when he says, be perfect like my Father in heaven is perfect, if we're going to take Paul at his word, imitate me while I imitate Jesus, then we got to love. The Sermon on the Mount becomes a whole lot more than just, oh, that's nice. I'll think about turning the other cheek. What does that really mean? Oh, that's nice. I probably should pray for people who despitefully use me. That makes, you, you get what I'm saying? What Jesus was sharing with the world was radical. Treat people right who mistreat you. Give someone the extra clothes when they've already stolen the other pair from you. Right? I was at a gas station. I thought about not telling this story, but I was at a gas station um, kind of recently, and um, I'm filling up my tank um, with gas, and I have, I, have some, I have some cash in my pocket. I have some cash in my pocket. And I see this person approaching me, and I know the person, like, I know it, you know? Like, here it comes. They're going to ask me for gas, okay? And I can sense it. I'm like, here it is, okay? And I'm trying to, like, you know, I'm just pumping gas and putting the gas in the Prius. Yes, I know it's shocking. Priuses take gas. They're not electric. Okay, whatever, okay? Right? And so I'm just trying to stay close to my Prius and just not engage. Don't engage. I have places to be. Don't engage, right? And so I'm trying not to engage, and the person already spots me, and we make eye contact, and I'm like, it's over. Okay, here it comes, right? You know how it is, right? <laughs> I see you see me. I saw you see me. Okay? Right? And so they come up and the guy says, you know, we don't have any gas. You know, our car's out of gas completely. Do you have any cash that you could spare? Okay? And I don't know why I didn't think, well, let me just like swipe my card over here. Maybe because I don't want him to have like my card over there because it's with me. I don't know. I didn't really fully think it through, but I knew I had 20 bucks in my pocket. I had 20. I had a cool 20 in my pocket. And I'm like, okay, you know, I mean, I could totally use that to buy Taco Bell four different times this week, but whatever, okay? <laughs> you need gas because you don't have any gas. And the way I interpreted his message was he is stuck at this gas station. I was like, yeah, man, I got some cash. Here you go. Have a nice day. God bless you. And he's like, oh, thank you. God bless you too. He takes the 20 into his car, turns on his truck, and drives out of the parking lot. And I'm like, huh? I'm having an unholy moment. Like, you better bring my 20 back, bro. What is up with this, right? And I'm, you know, and I go through all the stages of anger and grief or whatever about my $20 that is now gone. I hit the anger stage real fast. Like, excuse me, what? And then, and then I felt like foolish. I'm like, why are you giving people money that are just going to drive away with your money? You know, like, you should have walked over there and taken the extra five minutes to go pump gas for him. And I'm like, that's what Bob Parrish would have done. But I'm not Bob, I'm Rob. <laughs> And Rob loses $20 on a regular basis, apparently, right? So <laughs> what is happening, right? And so I went through all the stages, and then all of a sudden it dawned on me, you know what, I'm not in control with what he does with that. If he did something bad with it, that's fine. Maybe he wanted to go across the street because gas was cheaper over there. I don't know, right? But that's not my job. Our job is to love. And then however people react to you afterwards, is that's on them. That's up to them. Our job is to simply love in every way, shape, and form. That's what Jesus did. But I can guarantee you that that love's not always easy. It's not easy. But I can also guarantee you that, it, that it's worth it. It's worth it to pursue love. And church, I think that this is what true education is. It's teaching the world around us, teaching first our homes, the people in our homes, that we've got to pursue love in Jesus every single day. And that we've got to live love every single day as a home. Do my neighbors know that I love them in Jesus? If I'm going to be honest, no, they don't. Our, my interactions with them are minimal, right? Is that what we teach as a church, right? That we need to pursue love every single day and that we need to live love every single day so that when people pass this church, they know, hey, that's the place where we're loved, right? And is that what we're doing as, as a Christian school, as North Dallas Adventist Academy? Are we really teaching our kids not just the math and the science, but are we teaching them to love every single day? to pursue love, and to live it every single day. And I think that that's how we should raise each other. Not just the youth, but what if that was life for everyone, right? That they grew up, and the village that it takes to raise, because church, I am passionate about this. I believe it takes all three. It takes a home and a church and a school to really raise these kids right. And if we're going to really raise these kids right, then we should probably start raising ourselves right too, amen? Let's do it all. And doing the things of God, doing the things that we should do as Christians is so vitally important. But as we wrap that up with love, as we wrap it up with love, as we pursue it every single day, 
all of a sudden the things that I do have such a deeper meaning. Because I'm doing them because I'm in love with Jesus. Right? And if we can continue to teach that as a church, as a home, as a school, what change would happen in our community? What things would be recognized? What things would be realized? That's why, that's why I'm so passionate about this vision. That's what it's about. Risking everything to love the people in our homes, not just because they're family, because God has placed them. We're stewards of them, as was said earlier. We must pursue love every single day, and then we must go out and we must live it, desperately try to live it. And when we fall flat on our face, get back up and say, I'll try to love better. But if I'm following Jesus, there's a good chance I'll do it all right. I'll make it happen. Those are the two things. And I really believe that it all comes down to that. I don't want to be like simple, but I really believe it all comes down to that because that's hard enough. <laughs> and and if, I, if, I, if, I, if I love Jesus and he transforms my life because of that beautiful collision, then all the different things are going to come along with that too. It's not a way to get out of things. It's a way to do everything by following Jesus, by loving him. I want to I share a story or two more with you as we, as we wrap up. Short stories, I promise. Um, I was working out with my buddy Jared when I used to live in Arizona. We would work out late at night, um, and in typical dude male fashion, after you lift weights, you got to eat protein, okay? Because somehow, obviously, all that protein goes right to your muscles, and you get super buff, right? Never seen that happen, okay? Somehow, I just got magically super buff, amen, okay? <laughs> amen, all right, so moving on. So we would go to the gas station right next to, our, next to our gym, a little shell gas station there, and we would protein up. We'd get like the protein drink and the protein bar, probably overload on protein to our body's not using it, right? But we thought we were, we were supposed to do that because we're exercising, we're trying to be healthy. My friend Jared is super extroverted, like a little too extra, like he's in your face sometimes, okay? Like he's out there, like extroverted, all about like, you know, like you know, when, when you watch a football game with him, you're getting, your hand hurts because the high fives are too intense. And it's like, calm down, it's just a game. We're not even playing the game right now. Can you please calm down? That's who he is. And so in true Jared fashion, every time we'd go to this gas station, he would, he would see the gas attendant who was this gruff kind of older man, and we'd be like, hi, how are you? And he'd be like, good, how are you? Okay? Doesn't seem too happy about life, seems kind of angry, whatever, right? And so he's like, how are you? Good, 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 how are you? All right? And in true Jared fashion, every single night he would say, God bless you. And I remember the first time he said it, I was like, man, why are you saying that, dude? Like, I don't think that guy wants to hear that. And sometimes he would say nothing, and sometimes he would mumble some negative sounds, you know, just like, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I don't really know what that means. But I don't feel like he likes us saying that to him. He's not receiving it in a positive manner, okay? And he would say it every single night, God bless you, mm -hmm. okay? And we literally saw this guy every night. And one night there, I had worked out by myself, and so I went uh, to the gas station just to still get the protein and stuff, and I decided I was going to say what Jared said. I'd kind of gotten the habit of doing that with him uh, to this gas attendant, and he was there, and, and uh, I paid for my stuff, and as I'm kind of about to turn to walk out, I was like, hey, God bless you, man. And for the first time ever, instead of the, <clears throat> the negative response, which I was prepping for, so I was already like two steps towards the door, because I don't need that negativity, okay? I'm two steps towards the door. I don't need his negativity. Instead of this negative grunting, he said, eh, God bless you too. The least happy God bless you I've ever been told in my life. Like I've sneezed and been, been received better, okay? I said, hey, God bless you. Yeah, God bless you too. And I was like, oh, okay? And there's this, there's this part of you when something really, really good happens. There's this little part of you that does like a little dance, okay? Okay, there's a... There's a, there's a, okay, I'm going to go down this path. Okay, so there's a movie, it's called Hitch, okay? You don't have to reference whether you watched it or not, okay? We'll keep those hands down. But there's a movie, and in this movie, this guy is being instructed on how to go on a date. And the first date goes great, and it goes so great that it ends with a kiss. We won't talk about whether that's appropriate or not, that's a different sermon, okay? But the first, the first date ends with a kiss, okay? And this guy is trying to be calm, cool, and collected, right? But the lady shuts the door, and he's walking down the sidewalk, He's walking down the sidewalk, just got this first kiss from this lady he's in love with, and he does this weird dance, okay? Like, like you know, like weird dance. Sorry, that's probably uncomfortable for you, okay? I won't do it again, I promise, okay? He does this weird dance because he's so excited. He's so excited. And then he thinks he hears a door open, and so he freezes right up and starts walking normally again, right? Okay? Some of you have been there. I can see it in your eyes. You're like, yeah, totally, totally done that, okay? I know, I see you, okay? That's what I felt like doing when this man was like, God bless you. I, was, I, was, I almost danced in the gas station, which probably would have made him not want to say, God bless you ever again. He'd be like, I'm not saying that ever again, sir. Okay? But I was so happy. 
And maybe that's the simplest of things to make you happy, but he'd finally had a God connection with someone. His heart had been opened up just enough for him to respond back and say, you know what, God bless you too. I might not know everything that means, but God bless you too. Wow. For me, that was life-changing. Little interactions matter a whole lot. I was a camp counselor. I was 19 years old. Last story. Camp counselor, 19 years old. And if the worship team wants to come up, um, they can. And I was in charge of 10, 10 boys every single week. 10 to 12 boys, ages 10 to 12, and then 13 to 15, and then high school age, and so on and so forth. And I was so worried. I was like, what parent would put me in charge of other kids? Why should no one should do that? I'm 19 years old. I'm going to lose somebody. Okay? And why do I want to hang out with 10-year-olds all week? I don't think so. I had not yet seen my future in teaching, okay? Obviously, God had not put that call on my heart yet, okay? And so there I am, and I'm so, so worried. I don't, they, like, they're messy, they're rude, okay? I can't really discipline them. Okay, I can make them, like, run, but that's not really right either, okay? They don't want to go to sleep. They don't want to brush their teeth. They don't want to shower. They're rude. Have I mentioned that they're rude? And I remember wondering, but I was like, here they are. I don't know what homes they come from. I don't know what churches they come from. Maybe they're perfect. Maybe they're broken, and this is the only seven days that they're going to get to experience the love of Jesus. And I'm with them all day, every day, unfortunately. How can I love them? And so I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read that little chapter in Corinthians about love every single day. And I'm not going to miss a single day. Because if I don't read that, they're probably not going to experience any type of love because I don't even like them. Okay? They are great kids. They really were great kids. <laughs> they are super awesome. <laughs> Good memories. Okay? But I was like, I got to read that verse, every, I got to read that chapter every single day. And so that's what I did the whole summer, every single day. I didn't miss one day. I didn't miss one day because if I missed one day, I was fearful of what, what unlove might happen. And what I magically discovered, and it wasn't really magic because that's how Jesus' love just is. I was able to treat those kids probably better than they deserved with the love that they needed, even when they were acting crazy. And what was interesting was my life was changed too. As I tried my desperate, in my desperate ways to love them, I really began to understand how much God loves me. Church, can we pursue love? Every single day. And in that pursuit of love, can we live it every single day? That is what our world needs. That's what we need, is a pursuit of love himself. As we sing this song, we'll come to the altar. I would just encourage you to come to the altar to make that commitment, that recommitment, wherever you are on your journey. Make that step to say, Jesus, I want to pursue you every single day, starting today. Renew it. Renew it again wherever you're at. We all need to come to the altar.